This is a reading from the mystical city of God, the Incarnation, by Venerable Mary of Agrita, chapter 18. Most Holy Mary and Joseph distribute the gifts received from the Magi, and they remain in Bethlehem until their departure for the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple. 573. After the departure of the three kings and after the due celebration of the great mystery of the adoration of the infant Jesus, there was really nothing to wait for in that poor yet sacred place, and they were free to leave it. The most prudent mother then said to St. Joseph, My master and spouse, the offerings which the kings have made to our God and child must not remain here idle, but they must be applied in the service of his majesty and should be used according to his will and pleasure. I deserve nothing, even of temporal goods. Dispose of all these gifts as belonging to my son and to thee. The most faithful of husbands answered with his accustomed humility and courtesy that he would leave all to her and would be pleased to see her dispose of them. But her majesty insisted anew and said, Since thou makest an excuse of humility, my master, do it then for love of the poor who are waiting for their share. And they have a right to the things which their heavenly father has created for their sustenance. They therefore immediately concluded to, to divide the gifts into three parts, one destined for the temple of Jerusalem, namely the incense and myrrh, as well as part of the gold, another part as offering to the priest who had circumcised the child in order that he might use it for himself and for the synagogue or oratory in Bethlehem, and the third part for distribution among the poor. This resolve they executed with generous and fervent affection. 574. The Almighty made use of a poor but honorable and pious woman to be the occasion of their leaving the cave. She had come a few times to visit our queen, for the house in which she lived was built up against the wall of the city, not far from the cave. Some time later, this devout woman, not being aware of what had happened, but having heard the rumor of the king's coming, held a conversation with Most Holy Mary and asked her whether she had heard this, that some wise men, who were said to be kings, had come from far, seeking the Messiah. The heavenly princess, aware of the good disposition of this woman, took occasion to instruct her and catechize her in the common belief, without revealing to her the hidden sacrament connected with herself and the sweetest child whom she held in her arms. Tobias chapter 12, verse 7. In order to relieve her poverty, she gave her some of the gold destined for the poor. Thereby, the condition of this fortunate woman was much improved, and she became detached with heart and soul to her teacher and benefactress. She invited the Holy Family to live in her house, and it, as it was a poor one, it was so much the more accommodated to the founders and builders of holy poverty. The poor woman pleaded with great persistence as she saw the great inconvenience to which most the most holy Mary and Joseph with the child were subject in the cave. The queen did not refuse her offer and answered that she would let her know of her decision. Mary and St. Joseph conferred with each other and they resolved to leave the cave and lodge in the house of this woman, awaiting there the time of the purification and the presentation in the temple. They did it so much more the willingly as it afforded them a chance to remain near the cave of the nativity and also because many people began to frequent the cave on account of the rumor of the visit of the kings, which had been spread about. 575. On account of these and other considerations, Most Holy Mary, with St. Joseph and the Sacred Child, took leave of the cave, although with tenderest regret. They accepted the hospitality of that fortunate woman who received them with the greatest charity and assigned to them the larger portion of her dwelling. The holy angels and ministers of the Most High accompanied them in human forms, which they had always retained. Whenever the Heavenly Mother and St. Joseph, her spouse, piously revisited the memorable spots of this sanctuary, they came and went with them as numerous courtiers delegated to their service. Moreover, when the child and his mother took leave of the cave, God appointed an angel as its keeper and watcher, as he had done with the Garden of Paradise. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. And this guard remained, and does remain to this day, sword in hand, at the opening of the cave, and never since then has an animal entered there. That this holy angel does not hinder the entrance of hostile infidels, in whose possession this and other places are, is because of the judgments of the Most High, who allows men to execute the designs of his wisdom and justice. This permission would not be necessary 
if Christian princes were filled with fervent zeal for the honor and glory of Christ and would seek the restoration of these holy places, consecrated by the blood and the labors of the Lord and of his most holy mother and by the works of our redemption. And even if this would not be possible, there is no excuse for not attending with faithful diligence to the decent keeping of the mysterious places, since nothing is impossible to the believer who can overcome the mountains. Matthew chapter 17, verse 19. I was given to understand that the pious devotion and veneration for the Holy Land is one of the most powerful and efficacious means for establishing and confirming Catholic monarchies, and no one can deny that many of their excessive and unnecessary expenses could be avoided by employing their resources in such a pious enterprise, which would be pleasing both to God and to men. For in making such an honest use of their incomes, there is no need of outward justification. 576. The most pure Mary and her spouse, having with her divine child moved to the dwelling in the vicinity of the cave, remained there until, according to the requirements of the law, she was to be present herself, with her firstborn for purification in the temple. For this mystery, the most holy of creatures resolved to dispose herself worthily by a fervent desire of carrying the infant Jesus as an offering to the eternal Father in his temple. By imitating her son, by seeking the adornment and beauty of great virtue as a worthy offering and victim for the Most High. With this intention, the heavenly lady during the, lady, during the days which still remained until her purification performed such heroic acts of love and of all other virtues that neither the tongue of angels nor of men can explain them. How much less can this then be done by a useless and entirely ignorant woman? By sincere piety and devotion, the Christians who dispose themselves by reverent contemplation will merit to feel these mysteries. Judging of the more intelligible favors received by the Virgin Mother, they can surmise and imagine the others which do not fall within the scope of human words. 577. From his very birth, the infant Jesus spoke to his sweetest mother in audible words. For immediately after his birth, as mentioned in chapter the 10th, he said to her, Imitate me, my spouse, make thyself like unto me. This was then, this was when they were alone, and although he always spoke to her most plainly, Saint Joseph never heard his words until the child was one year of age, when he also spoke to him. Nor did the heavenly lady reveal this secret, for she understood that it was only for her. The conversations of the infant God were such as were worthy of the greatness of his majesty and his infinite power, such as were befitting the most pure and holy, the most wise and prudent of all creatures next to himself, and one who was his true mother. Sometimes he said, My dove, my chosen one, my dearest mother. Canticle chapter 2 verse 10. In such caressing words as were contained in the canticles and other continual inter interior intercourse, the most holy son and mother passed their time, and in these the heavenly princess received favors and was delighted by caresses so sweet and loving as exceed those of the canticles of Solomon, and greater ones than all the just and holy souls enjoyed from the beginning to the end of the world. Many times during these mysteries of his love, the infant Jesus repeated these words already mentioned, Make thyself like unto me, my dove, and my, my mother, and my dove. As they were words of life and infinite power, and as most holy Mary at the same time was furnished with the infused knowledge of all the interior operations of the, of the soul of her only begotten, no tongue can declare, no, nor thought can comprehend the effect wrought in the most candid and inflamed heart of his mother, of the God-man. 578. Among the more rare and excellent privileges of most pure Mary, the chief one is that she is mother of God, which is the foundation of all the rest. The second is that she was conceived without sin. The third, that she enjoyed many times the beatific vision in this mortal life. And the fourth is that she continually saw clearly the most holy soul of her son and all its operations for her imitation. She had it present to her eyes as the most clear and pure mirror in which she could behold herself again and again in order to adorn herself with most precious gems of virtue made in imitation of those seen in that most holy soul. There she saw it united with the divine word and she exercised her humility in seeing how much her own human nature 
was inferior to that of Christ. She perceived with the clearest insight the acts of gratitude and praise with which the soul of Christ praised the Almighty for having been created out of nothing as the rest of the souls and for the graces and gifts with which it was endowed above others as a creature and especially for having been elevated and made godlike by the union of the human nature with the divinity. She pondered over this. She pondered over his petitions, prayers, and supplications to his eternal Father for the human race, and how in all his other activity he prepared himself for its redemption and instruction as the sole redeemer and teacher of man for eternal life. 579. All these works of the most holy humanity of Christ our supreme good, his most pure mother, continually sought to imitate. There is much to say concerning this great mystery of her imitation in his history. For she had this example and model incessantly before her eyes, and according to it, she regulated her own activity and behavior during the incarnation and nativity of her son. Like a busy bee, she continually built up the sweetest honeycomb of delights for the incarnate word. His majesty, having come from heaven as our redeemer and teacher, wished that his most holy mother, of whom he had formed his human existence, should participate in a most exalted and singular manner in the fruits of the common redemption, and that she should be, cho be the chosen and selected disciple in whom his teaching should be vividly stamped, and whom he wished to make as similar to himself as possible. In the light of these intentions and blessed purposes of the incarnate word, we must judge of the greatness of Mary's deeds and of the delights which he enjoyed while resting upon her arms and reclining upon her breast. For it was indeed the bridal chamber and the couch of this, the true spouse. Canticle chapter 1 verse 15. 580. During the days in which the most holy queen tarried near Bethlehem before the purification, some of the people came to see and speak with her, but almost all of them were of the poorest class. Some of them came because of the alms which she distributed, others because they had heard of the kings who had visited the cave. <clears throat> All of them spoke of this visit and of the coming of the Redeemer, for in those days, not without divine predisposal. The belief that the birth of the Messiah was at hand was very widespread among the Jews, and the talk about it was very frequent. This gave the most prudent mother repeated occasion to exercise herself in magnanimous works, not only by guarding the secret of her bosom, and by conferring within herself about all that she saw and heard, but also by directing many souls toward the knowledge of God, by confirming them in the faith, instructing them in the practice of virtues, enlightening them in the mysteries of the Messiah whom they were expecting, and dispelling the ignorance in which they were cast as a low-minded people, little versed in the things of God. Sometimes, their talk about these matters was so full of error and womanish prattle that the simple St. Joseph smiled in secret. He wondered at the heavenly wisdom and force of the answers with which the great lady met their gossip and instructed them at her patience and gentleness in leading them to the truth and to the perception of the light, at her profound humility and yet patient reserve with which she knew how to dismiss all of them consoled rejoiced and furnished with all that was good for them to know. She spoke to them words of eternal life, which penetrated, inflamed, and strengthened their hearts. John chapter 6, verse 69. Instruction which the Most Holy Mary gave, our Queen, gave me. 581. My daughter, by the divine light, I knew better than all other creatures at what a low value the Most High esteems earthly blessings and riches. Therefore, in my holy liberty of spirit, I felt myself troubled and inconvenienced by the possession of the treasures of the kings offered to my Most Holy Son. As in all my deeds, I was to shine in humility and obedience. I did not wish to appropriate them to myself, nor dispose of them according to my own will, but according to the wishes of my spouse Joseph. In this resignation, I managed to act as if I were his handmaid, and as if none of these gifts concerned me in any way, for it is debasing, and for you weak creatures, very dangerous to appropriate or attribute any of the goods of the earth, be they of material possessions or goods of honor, for all this cannot be done without covetousness, ambition, 
and vain ostentation. 582. I wish to tell thee all this, my dearest, in order that thou mayest know how to refuse riches or honor as due to thee, and not appropriate to thyself any of them, especially not if thou receive them from persons of influence and exalted station. Preserve thy interior liberty, and make no show of a thing which is worth nothing, and which cannot justify thee before God. If anything is brought to thee, never say, This is given to me, or is presented to me, but this the Lord sends to our convent. Pray to God for those whom, this, whom his majesty has sent as the instruments of his mercies, and to mention the name of the giver, in order that they may pray particularly for him, and that he may not be disappointed in the purpose of his gift. Also, do not receive it personally, lest you raise a suspicion of covetousness, but let those appointed for this duty receive it. And if in thy office as superior thou must make distribution of things within the convent, let it be with detachment and without any show of personal rights of possession in them. Yet at the same time, as one who knows what she does not deserve, that she does not deserve any favors, do not forget to thank the Most High and the Giver. That which is brought to the other religious, thou must acknowledge thankfully as the superior, and immediately see that thou apply it for the community, without reserving any part of it for thy own use. Do not inquire curiously about the incomes of the convent, in order that thou mayest not take a sensible pleasure therein, and that thou mayest not seek delight in the reception of such favors, for frail and passionate nature incurs many defects in such a transaction, and of the few of the defects does it render much account to itself. Nothing can be trusted to infected human nature, for it always seeks after more than it possesses, and it never says enough, and the more it receives, the greater thirst it has for more. 583 but it is to the intimate and frequent intercourse with the Lord by unceasing love, praise, and reverence that I wish thee to attend most of all. In this, I wish, my daughter, that thou work with all thy strength and that thou apply thy faculties and powers incessantly with great watchfulness and care, for without this, the inferior parts will inev inevitably weigh down the soul, derange and upset it, divert and cast it down, causing it to lose the vision of the highest good. Wisdom chapter 9, verse 15. This loving intercourse of the Lord is so delicate that even by listening or attending, attending to the deceits of the enemy, the soul loses it. On this account, the enemy makes great efforts to draw thy attention toward himself, knowing that the punishment of listening to him will be the concealment of the object of its love from the soul. Canticle chapter 5, verse 6. As soon as it carelessly ignores the beauty of the Lord, it enters upon the byways of neglect and is deprived of the divine sweetness. Canticle chapter 1, verse 7. When afterwards the soul, having with sorrow experienced the evils of such inadvertence, wishes to return to seek him, it does not always find or recover him. Canticle chapter 3, 1, 2. As the demon who deceived it then presents other delights, so vile and unlike those to which the soul has been accustomed interiorly, new cause of sadness, disturbance, dejection, lukewarmness and dissatisfaction arises and its whole interior is filled with dangerous confusion 584 of this truth my dearest thou thyself hast some experience wherein thou couldst notice the effects of neglect and tardiness in believing the favors of the lord it is time that thou be prudent in thy sincerity and constant in keeping up the fire of the sanctuary leviticus chapter 6 verse 12 without ever losing sight for a moment of that same object which I attended to with all the powers of my soul and my faculties. Although the distance between thy conduct, that of a mere wormlet, and that which I propose for thy imitation is great, and although thou canst not enjoy the supreme good so unreservedly as I, nor live in the same condition as I, yet since I instruct thee and show thee what I did, to assimilate myself to my most holy Son, thou canst imitate me according to thy strength, using my doings as a mirror. I saw him in the mirror of his humanity, thou in my soul and person. If the Almighty calls and invites all men to the highest perfection by following him, consider what thou art obliged to do. 
since thou hast been drawn toward the Most High by such a generous and powerful influence of his right hand. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Canticle chapter 1, verse 3.